Well, Croiso Kanesi Paub, have you? A warm welcome to everyone today. Uh, we are excited to begin our 35th year as a revived church here in New York City. I mean, have read Gweld Kamainto in a bike of Arroyd, Aknin Croisawi in Ru Ean, and Athli Ward and Aminani Amatrok and Dav Hevio. It's nice to see familiar faces and to welcome new. Well, there are people of all different religious backgrounds here today with us, and we thank you all for joining us in fellowship today. Then I go both your beef paub and door door heed, vath and guasanai heavy. We hope that all present will will find some spiritual nourishment in today's service. So some of the service is in Welsh because we feel it is very important to keep our beautiful language alive. So please feel free to join in and have fun with it, even if Welsh is not your first language. Of course, Saisneg and Kyle can yatad ma hevid. It's okay to use English as well today. That's permitted. Welsh can be a difficult language to master, so I thought we'd begin today's service with a mini icebreaker lesson, so that you can leave not just with inspiration in your soul, but also a little of our beautiful language in your heart. So would everybody say, Croeso, together? Croeso. Sorry? Croeso. Croeso means welcome. Croeso. Croeso. And Heduch. Can we say that one? Heduch. Excellent. Heduch means peace. Peace be with you. You might use that word today when we greet each other as neighbors during the service. Heduch. So now let's practice our Welsh by saying Psalm 116 together. The words are in your program. Um, if you prefer to use the English words, the translation, as you can see, is uh, below the Welsh. The word paub, by the way, paub means everyone. So let's all say these words together from Psalm 116 and we'll then begin with some singing. So everyone together, in English or in Welsh. Rydwi, wir, yn carri'r argloedd, am ei fod yn grando ar fy ngweiddi. Pan oedd ni mewn helbil ac yn galw arno, achef fi, dymer argloedd yn hael a charedig. Ac ef achebir, achebodd fi, pan oedd ni'n daimlo'n mor isel. Rydw i'n mynd i fyw yn foddlon i'r argloedd ar dir y byw. Sut allaf dal i'n ôl iddo am fod mor da ti ag ataf. Rydw i am galw gadw apfyng a weddidion i'r argloedd o flaen eu bobl. Rydw i'n cyflwyno offrwm o ddiolch i ti o'r argloedd. Hallelujah. Diolch yn fawr, thank you very much, diolch yn fawr. Ac nawr, gadewch ni agor ein llyfr emynau i emyn rhif Pedwadig now. So if we could now please begin by singing hymn number 49 in your hymn books. Mor Agos Ambeth Wife, sometimes so close.
Please sit down. Let us gather our hearts and minds together as we offer our prayers unto Almighty God. Let us pray. O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We ask that you would accept our gratitude. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of the world, and the wonder of life, and the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, and the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We also thank you for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone and each other. But of all, above all, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and for the truth of his incarnation and the example of his life. And we thank you for all those who have gone before us in this life, who fought the fight and kept the faith and are now at rest with thee. Give us grace, we beseech thee, O God, to follow their good example so that we might by thy grace be included in your heavenly kingdom. And all these prayers and all our prayers we sum up in the words our Savior Jesus has taught us, saying, I am taught by the
Frodi Rachwiorydd, nid lle pawb ydi ceisio bod yn athrawon sy'n dysgu pobl eraill yn yr eglwys. Fe ddylech sylweddoli y bydwyn ni sy'n dysgu eraill yn cael ein barni yn byw llym. Rydyn ni gyd yn gwneud bob math o gamgyrydiaeth, os oes rhywun yn gallu reoli a'i dafod, a dweud dim byd o'i lefydd, dyna i chi berson perffaith. Rhywun sy'n gallu reoli a'i hun yn llwyr. Rydyn ni'n rhoi ffrwn ar geffyl i wneud yn eich ffyrdd i ni, a droi i'r cyfeiriad rydyn ni am iddo fynd. Y gyda llongau mawr sy'n cael ei gyrru gan wyntoedd cryfion, lliw bach iawn sydd ei angen i'r peilod, neu troi nhw'i ble bynnag mae'n dewis mynd. Dyna i chi'r tafod, mae'n rhan fach iawn o'r corp, ond mae'n gallu honni pethau mawr iawn. Blam fach iawn sydd ei angen i roi coedwig enfawr ar dân a phlam felly ydy'r tafod. Mae'r tafod yn llawn drygioni, ac o blith holl wannau corff, hwn ydy'r un sy'n gallu llyfrydd bersonoliaeth gyfan. Mae'n gallu dynistri o holl gwrs o'n bywyd ni. Mae'n phlam sydd wedi ei ddanio gan eich fferm. Mae pobl yn gallu dofi pob math a anfeiliad ac adar, ymlysgiaid a physgod, ond oes neb byw sy'n gallu dofi'r tafod. Mae'n ddrw cwbl a phreolus, mae'n llawn gwenwyn marwol. Gallwn addoli ein harglwydd a'n tad nefol yn fynyd, ac yn ar fynyd nesaf rydyn ni'n mylltudio pobl sydd wedi ei creu ar fewn diw. Mae bendydd a melltydd yn llifo o'r un geir, Fe ddylai hi ddim bod felly, brodi ddechwi oriw. Ydy dŵr glân a dŵr hallt yn tarddu o'r un ffynnon? Ydy o lewydd yn tyfu a gwaed yn ffigis, neu ffigis ar rhywydden, wrth gwrs ddim? A dydy pwll a dŵr hallt ddim yn rhoi dŵr glân i ni chwaith? Let us pray. Cleave now our darkness. We beseech thee, O God, by the light of thy truth, and let not thy word return unto thee void. Amen. Today's epistle lesson is from the book of James. James is Yaakov in Hebrew, and that was his name. But nobody knows who he was, and he this epistle has been ascribed to three different Yaakovs, one of whom was the brother of the Lord. But we really don't know who wrote it. It reminds me of the time when I was a graduate lecturer at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and I joined the Iona community. And the Iona community had been founded by Lord George MacLeod, who gave his 
personal wealth to buy the island of Iona, three miles long and one mile wide, on which sat an ancient abbey. And George had the vision to rebuild the abbey, and he recruited uh, younger divines from the four uh, theological schools in Scotland to assist the stonemasons uh, in summertime by chipping rock and helping out and learning the ways of Scottish stonemasons. Some of them will not be mentioned in the pulpit. It fell to me to assist George, Lord MacLeod, as he met the ferry across from Finnerford, uh, less than half a mile. And on Saturday, when the buses brought the tourists, this being 1956, a long time ago, um, there were few tours, and most of them were English. And George met them at the uh, jetty and welcomed them to the island of Iona, upon which St. Columba, having been exiled from Catholic Ireland founded uh, the nexus of what became the education of the Scots who were busy paint, painting themselves blue once a year until uh, Columba brought the gospel and education. Now, here, over here, said George to the 12 tour English tours, is the uh, uh, stone where, the very stone where Columba laid his head in the year 573. And the next Saturday, he met the f same fairy, and he would say, now over here is the very stone where Columba laid his uh, weary head as he got here in uh, the year 565. Well, Columba indeed founded education and the Church of Scotland, but he didn't do it anything like George described. And I said to him, last week you had the stone over here, oh, and this week you had the stone over there. I had the temerity to say, and he said to me with a twinkle in his eye, that's the trouble with the English. They don't know how to tell the facts from the truth. I don't know about the Welsh, the Welsh are able to distinguish some facts from some truth in my observation. We Scots never learned. Anyway, James, the epistle of James, reminds me 
of the facts and the truth. The truth was that Columba brought the gospel to the Picts, who we know as Scots. And the facts really don't matter. It was so long ago. The lead story in the Times last Thursday was reporting the discovery of deep underneath the ground thousands of humanoid bones that had been buried there 1.2 or 1.4 million years ago. Paleoanthropologists and theologians agree that burying the dead is a modern, say, uh, from 6,000 BC until today. The fact is, these remains, humanoid, they were part of our family tree, and people were burying their loved ones and dead in this cave in South Africa. And it's an amazing story. They, they have assembled 15 skeletons and the feet and the hands are very similar to yours and mine. But the jaw and the uh, uh, other facial features, and the brain are different. The brain is no larger than an orange. 1.2 million years ago, five feet nine was the biggest one, a hundred pounds. Paleon, paleoanthropologists suggest these were the dimensions. The only way they could recover these thousands of fossils, humanoid fossils, was to recruit six women who were thin enough to get through a space six inches wide, underwater. And it took them two years to assemble 15 figures. They say there are many more still to be reclaimed. 1.2 million years ago. Somewhat later, <laughs> Augustine, St. Augustine, in the year 500, approximately, uh, A.D., said that that which is called the Christian religion existed among the ancients and never did not exist. St. Augustine, the true religion first got its name with the incarnation of Jesus of Nazareth. We might call that evolutionary incarnation or incarnational 
evolution. Imagine that, Saint Augustine, the pillar of the Western Church, said, and I'll repeat it, that which we called the Christian religion existed among the ancients and never did not exist. From the beginning of the human race until Christ came in the flesh, at which time the true religion, which already existed, got the name Christianity. Clearly, the early centuries <clears throat> of the Christian era, sharp lines of difference between Jewish and Christian and Hindu and all the other religions were not clearly drawn. So it was with the early church. The early, <coughs> the early church did not have any Bible but the Hebrew scriptures until the fifth century there was no Bible as we know it. The epistle of James, nobody knows who wrote it, is unlike any of Paul's epistles or Peter's epistles in that it has no specific town, or no specific uh, issue that it deals with, uh, no specific uh, Bishop Lydia is entirely absent. No one, <clears throat> no one is named. None is specified. No issue, no place writer and audience are unknown. There is no general theme to James. It is rather a collection of moral precepts. The main message of the epistle may be summed up by three points. Care for the poor, Faith without works is dead and the sins of the tongue. James writes, the, as we heard read, the tongue is a fire. The tongue can create and destroy human relationships. The tongue can inspire people to courageous acts and define achievable, cowardly act. Pindar said, the word liveth longer than the deed. Our author, who was a Jewish and a Christian, and he had a Hellenistic background. He'd been to university and he knew how to write and he especially knew how to use diatribe as an effective way instrument to
to get his point across. According to the gospel writers, the brothers of Jesus until the, the resurrection thought he was crazy. But James, if he wrote, and some scholars claim the brother of Jesus wrote the epistle of James, he must not have been too crazy to have his brother head of the temple in Jerusalem, which the brother of James was. But no one knows for sure. The usual tension existed between those Christians who said you had to keep the Mosaic law, you had to be circumscribed, circumcised to be a, uh, a true Christian. Uh, a higher faith was ascribed to those Christians who kept the Mosaic laws. And Paul, Paul didn't give a fig for the Mosaic laws. He said, faith and soter, salvation is available by faith. But our author thinks that faith without deeds is dead. Let me illustrate the word care for the poor was one of the three emphases of James. We all know the difference between bending down and pitying someone and treating some poor folk with enabling power. There is a difference between a handout and power to solve your own problems. Faith without deeds is dead. Pity without faith, stemming from faith, is dead. And condescending, that's the trouble with most missionaries in the 19th century. They thought they were going to save those benighted uh, uh, poor Africans or Asians, as we see. Luther called James an epistle of straw because there are no Pauline blood and guts. The most pungent line I can leave with you The tongue is a fire. The tongue can create relationships. The tongue can destroy relationships. The 
the tongue can support us and the tongue can take us down. And thanks be to God, we have been given access to the faith that freedom takes, the faith of the gospel to be free, to regard each other, all of each other's as ourselves. You know, we're, <coughs> we are to love God and with all our hearts and all our souls and all our mind and our neighbor as ourself. There is only one way to regard your neighbor as yourself. And that is if you love yourself because you have been forgiven for all the sins your tongue has committed. And you know the secret of discerning truth from facts. The truth of the gospel is available to you and to me but the tongue is a fire. Watch out. And deeds without works are dead. And also works without deeds, redeem deeds, not condescending, not hooking up stories to get your own way, but the living truth. Thanks be to God for his gospel. Amen.
And now the announcements, the Kohoidiade, um, upcoming Welsh and Welsh related events. In place of our Tebach downstairs, we'll be holding our annual Nosen Lawan upstairs on the fifth floor of the church house. When you leave, turn right and turn right to the elevator. Uh, members and friends are invited to join us for uh, fun performances. We're most grateful to our organist, Mary Nelson, who's returning for the second year to accompany our musical efforts. The Women's Welsh Club of New York will hold its regular monthly meeting at the church on Saturday, October 3rd, 1.30 p.m. And the church council has new officers. Our new president is Caroline von Reitzenstein. I'm back as Vice President. Margaret. Margaret Williamson is back as Treasurer. And Chris Evans is our new Secretary. And um, Audrey Roberts has stepped down handling the tea, but Colleen Kennedy has agreed to step forward. So if she comes up asking you, smile and say yes. Um, and a serious announcement. Um, our pastor, Dr. Philip Newell, who's been leading us for lo these many years, will be retiring this fall. And uh, we offer our heartfelt thanks for his spiritual and ethical guidance. The council has a pastoral nominating committee of David Morgan, Margaret Williamson, Don Farrow, and William Parry. And according to our bylaws, we need one member from the church congregation to join us. And if we have no waving hands, don't worry, we'll talk to some of you later. We know the usual suspects. Um, we have some names already, and uh, we need to move on this, of course, sooner rather than later. There's no exact date for uh, Dr. Mule leaving us as pastor. He will never leave us. And did I get everything else? I think that's all the announcements officially on the back, plus the extras. And would Margaret Williamson and Chris Evans come up, please, for the offertory?
and love of God and of His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, rest upon you and remain with you this day and forever.